Today's stuff we're going to be learning today is Baba Batra Daf Zion. Today's stuff is sponsored by Binyamin Cohen and Renana Dine in honor of their first wedding anniversary. We got together by learning Daf, and our favorita eventually led to our chupa. We're happy to be able to mark our anniversary by sharing our love of Talmud with others through the Hadron community. You're beautiful and Mazal Tov. May you continue to learn for many, many years. Okay, we are going to, um, quick announcement, I will not be teaching on Zoom on Friday, which means that the Friday and Shabbat Dapim will go up early. Okay, I'll put them up at five in the morning Israel time and six in the morning. So you can learn early if you want. Um, there will be no regular Zoom just this Friday. And if we're already talking about that, starting on July 26th, there will be no Zoom for approximately a month till around then and the end of August. Um, I have to check exactly what day we'll start up again, but sometime in the last week of August, we'll start up again with the Zoom. So for one month there, we will not have Zoom. It means also dedications. I'm recording all this stuff in advance. So if you have dedications, you can try to get them in now. I've already started recording, so you might miss the window. Um, you can always put your dedications on other days, or we can just put it in writing. Okay, with that, we will get started at the bottom of Vav Amut Bet. So we're going to have our structure for today before we get to the next Mishnah, which is on a Mubet, is going to be four stories that happened. And Rav Chama is going to rule in all four of them. The first three will be very similar. The fourth one is a totally different type of uh, case. Hanu Betre. So we're at the second to last line on Vav Amubet. We have two people. Rashi tells us, Keshachaku Ha'achim. Okay, like two brothers, for example, divided a house. They inherited a house from their father. One lived upstairs and one downstairs. So, so they're living one on top of the other. Itavre tatai. The bottom house starts, as the top starts caving in a little. The house on top is intact, though, in the upper floor, but the the the, the ceiling for the person underneath keeps lowering and lowering and lowering. Until it becomes, we'll see from later on, it becomes almost impossible to get in and out. It seems like it's worse by the entrance area. So it's very hard to get in. Once you're in, it's sort of okay, but to get in and out, it's really difficult. So Amarle Tatai Eli, the one below says to the one above, Tav and Ivnye, let's rebuild our house because we can't live like this. Amarle, Ana Shapirka de Irna. So the upper guy says, I don't know what you're talking about, but it's all fine where I'm living. I got no problem. So the under the guy underneath realizes that the his brother living upstairs, or could have just been someone else, but let's say his brother living upstairs, like Rashi said, is not going to pay for any of this. So he says, fine, I can't live like this. So I'll pay for the rebuilding of the house. Let's just knock it down, rebuild it, and I'll pay for it. Amar, lately, so the upper brother says, you know, but I have nowhere to live. I'll rent you a house. Again, the, the bottom guy is so desperate, willing to do anything. But the upper guy is not taking the bait. I don't want to bother. Fine, you'll pay for it. That does, that's not the issue. I have to pack up. I have to move all my stuff. That's annoying. So the younger, the, the, under, the, the brother living downstairs says, but I can't get into my house. <laughs> What do you expect me to do? Which the older, the other upper one says, Shuf and here's where we realize that it's the entrance that's the biggest problem. Duck, you know, crawl in and get in. You know, go on your go on your stomach, get in, go on your stomach and get out. Okay. At least, you know, when you're in there, you'll be in there and you'll manage. There's a way to do it. That's really quite extreme. I'm a Rav Chama and guess. What the halacha is, Rav Chama rules, Bedina Kama Ake. The person living upstairs really can prevent this one living downstairs from rebuilding the house, which is crazy. And it really sounds like this whole thing goes against what we've seen over and over again and talked about the Siyum, about the Asita Yashar Tov. This seems to be the reverse of all that, right? About doing the what, what's right in the eyes of God and, and what's the right thing to do. Here we say, well, look, these are your rights. And all of these sugyot are going to basically give the first three sugyot we're going to see of Rav Chama's ruling. Rav Chama is of the opinion, your property is your property. You can do whatever you want, as long as you know, you're not really directly damaging the other one's property. We're going to see this in a different sugyot, also in other people's opinions throughout the Masechet, but that 
you know, you have the right to do what you have to do. You don't have to move. You don't have to inconvenience yourself. Okay, not at all. But we're going to have a few minor um, qualifications of this halacha. Number one. This is as long as the roof didn't go down to under 10 tefachim. Now, if you remember 10 tefachim, Eruvin and Shabbat, and right, the whole uh, uh, area, sukkah, and the height, minimum height of, of a living space is defined as 10 tefachim. That's really not high. That's 10 hand breaths, okay? Figure it out yourself. It's not very high, but that's the minimum. If it gets lower than that, of a shure, the shure of the beams, the ceiling beams lowered to, 10, now you would say, you would expect the Gemara to say, well, since you can't live in a space under that, then the upper person has to help. But the, the Gemara words it differently. Matse Amarle, at that point, once it's less than 10, the person downstairs can say, your upper house is now in my domain. Because again, that's the minimum domain. My domain, I own. Okay, now this is a good question. You would think he would have owned all the airspace of the bottom floor. But it turns out he really only technically owns the first 10 tefachim of airspace. So once the house of upstairs becomes, the, that floor comes into his own space, then it's his to do. Belom Shabbat I'm no longer subjected to you. You're in my house. So now I can kick you out and basically say time to move and I'm destroying the house. And second qualification. Well, if they didn't make any stipulation in the beginning, but if they made a stipulation when they divided, let's say it was brothers, when they divided the property and the bottom one said to the upper one, well, I'm, you know, I'm taking the downstairs under the condition that if we have some sort of problem and your house caves in on mine, then basically you're going to, you know, we're going to rebuild the house. Then, then you can knock down the house and rebuild. But even within this, it's not so clear because how much does it cave in for this, this stipulation to become effective? Okay, we're assuming that you made the stipulation, but you didn't say at what height. So that's going to be our next question. If they did make a stipulation, so what's the height that we already say? This is not livable. So I want you to pay attention to who's quoting who because we're going to come back to this in a minute. Amru Rabbanan Kameda Rabba. So the rabbi said in front of Rabba, Mishme de Marzutra Bereder of Nachman. They quoted that, okay, the rabbis quoted Marzutra, who was the son of Rav Nachman, de Amar Mishme de Rav Nachman. So they quoted, it's a quote of a quote of a quote, and this is why it's going to be important. So the rabbis quoted Rav Marzutra, who was the son of Rav Nachman, who quoted Rav Nachman. Ke'otasha Shaninu, it's just like we see in a chapter later in Baba Batra. Rumo kechatsi or ko kechatsi rochbo. I'll explain what that means in a minute. I'll give you the sugi there. The sugi is if I, okay, Rashi tells us, then look there, kotasha shaninu ba mocher peiro, that's the name of the chapter, ha mekabel ala mechabero libnot lo bayit. Okay, I hired you to build me a house, but we didn't just say what the height's supposed to be. So the height, we might have discussed length and width, but we didn't discuss the height. So what height house do you have to build? Obviously, it's going to affect how much materials you use, all that. So. If I hired you to buy, build me a house, we take okay, the rumo, the height, is chatsi or kova chatsi rochbo. We take the length and the width, we add them together, and then half that number is what the height of your house has to be, which is interesting theory. You know, ask architects about this, um, whether there's usually a correlation between space and height, right? I seem to think not. I think seems to think usually, right? Your, your height depends on what's, right? Sometimes you have higher ceilings, lower ceilings, but sort of depends on, you know, what you want to do with that room and, and how your space is. But it's not necessarily affected by how big your, your room is. Uh, could be, could be there's a bit of a connection. Anyway, that's what they quote Rabbi Nachman is saying. When they said that to Rabbi, Rabbi responded and said with a, with a line that comes up a bunch of places, Amaluhu Rabbi, Lama Mina Lachu, haven't I told you before? Don't hang empty jugs on Rav Nachman, meaning don't say that Rav Nachman said stupid things. Rav Nachman didn't say that, okay? That's not what he said. You got it all wrong. This is what Rav said. The way people live. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't help us. Vikama. Amarav Huna Bereid Rav Yeshua Kehechi Da'ayle Isteraita De Mechoz Avahada. 
it's a height that's going to allow you to bring in these reeds from Mahosa. Okay, it was a known thing, I guess, in there that area, what a reed of Mahosa was. And you can move around, you know, bring it in, bring it out. Okay, in other words, it's it's a height. Well, what I think number one he's saying, the way I understand it is this correlation between length and width is not really relevant. Okay, that's not an, an height, that height is dependent on length and width. No, it has to do with can you bring things into the house and move around with them without hitting into the ceiling, without, you know, knocking into the walls? It could be there's a little bit of a correlation because if there's more, you know, if there's more space, then I would, actually I would think it would be then you could use less height, right? It actually sounds like the reverse. But basically, no, it's not so helpful to us, this number, because it doesn't really tell us, right? Is it less or is it more? It might not be. Le it could be less. It could be more, depending on what the length and width of your house is, right? And what he's basically saying is, has to be that you can live comfortably and move things around. And when you're bringing things into your house, you don't knock into and maybe bringing standard things into your house, right? We all know that sometimes, you know, you try to bring a couch into your house and it won't fit through your door. It won't fit through, you know, that could happen or a doorway and you get stuck. And it's happened to me before. Um, but basically we mean basic essential items should be able to be moved around with ease. And that's what it's dependent on. And that's what Rav Nachman says. You quote Rav Nachman incorrectly. That's definitely not what Rav Nachman said. Okay, so it didn't really help us because it doesn't really give us a, an exact defined amount, um, but it does give us an idea. Okay, so again, what do we have? We basically had it that if the, the ceiling collapses of the upstairs, you know, starts lowering and somehow the upstairs is, is kind of lowering into the downstairs, basically the downstairs person cannot say we're rebuilding the whole house and inconvenience the person upstairs unless it gets lower to 10 tefachim, and unless they stipulated before. And if they stipulated before, then we're not exactly sure what the height is, but some sort of height that's lot higher than 10 to buffing high. Second situation. How will Gavra? These are all actual situations that happened. There was a person, He built a wall opposite the windows of his name, of his friend. Now you're not allowed to do that because if you build a wall by the windows, we saw this, right? What happens? The wall blocks the wind, the 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 light from getting in the window. What's the point of the window if not to get light into the house? So you're basically shading this person's house. But in this case, we're going to see what happens. Amarle. So we said to him, the guy within the house who had the window said, "Come afaratalai. You're making it dark in my house." Amarle, listen, I don't want to move my wall. So instead of moving my wall, how about I fill in, like a secher is a dam. So that's a, a, a um, saharnala. I'm going to dam up, basically, I'm going to fill in your window, okay, build you a solid wall there, and make a window up above. I'll, I'll break a part of your wall up, up above, and I'll make you a window higher up. And then my wall, which is, you know, at the height of your window right now, well, your window will be higher, and, and I'll pay for it. Well, Amarle, come rightly, la shitai. You're making my my wall weaker because you're you're um if you fill in this hole and then break above like a hole in my wall, that's gonna weaken my wall. First of all, just by knocking the wall and breaking pieces out, it's gonna weaken the wall underneath. And you're you're kind of filling in an empty space, which means that's not gonna be so strong, so solid. So Amarle. She says, fine, you're worried about me weakening the wall? I'll break the wall up to where your windows are. So I'll break the whole upper part of the wall and I'll rebuild that whole section. So you'll have a very, I won't break, you know, the to make a window. I'll just break the whole wall. I'll, I'll give you, let's say, I don't know, let's say the, the window is 10 tefachim off the ground. So your first 10 tefachim I'll leave. But above that, I'll knock down. I'll fill in a solid wall until the height of my wall. And then I'll make you a window on the upper part of the wall. And I'll I'll, I'll spend all the money for me. By the way, these stories sound a lot like Kamsa Bar Kamsa's story, where he, if you remember the story, right? I'll do this. I'll pay for the whole meal, right? I'll pay for my meal. I'll pay, just don't kick me out of here. Sounds very similar to the negotiations. Amrle. So what does he say back to him? If you build a wall that is an old wall at the bottom and you attach a new wall above that, 
that's Mila El on top of it, Chadita, Chadita means Chadasha, Lo Kaima, it's not going to stand because you're basically trying to, you know, cement, put cement between old and new. Well, it's not going to take to the old wall. That's not going to work well. Amar Lei, Sarchana Lei Ad Ara, fine, I'll go even farther. I'll break the entire wall and I'll build you a brand new wall. Ubanina la right, and I'll rebuild it. Vavina la cave bigave, and I'll put a nice window, you know, up above. Amarle still doesn't like it. Chada bekule beta atika lo kaima. You're gonna add one wall to my three walls of house that are old, and I'm gonna have a new wall now. That wall is not gonna attach well to the other two walls. In other words, old and new don't go well. Forget about the fact that one of your walls is gonna look different than all the rest of your wall. But, you know, it's not going to stand. It's not going to work well. No way, no how. Amrale agarna lach duchte. So he says, fine. I'm sorry, did I skip something? Sorry, I skipped. Amrale, so turn lach kule beta. Fine, I'll knock down your whole house. I'll rebuild your brand new house. It's interesting what the person will do. Obviously really wanted their wall there. So he's willing to go so far. I'll knock down your house. Banina lach kave I'll build you a brand new house. Now you have no claim against it. But of course he does, because what does he say? Am I lay lately duchte le about Where am I going to live in the meanwhile while you build me a house? I have nowhere to live. Am I lay a garna lach duchte. By the way, he didn't say that when he knocked down one wall. Also, it's hard to live in a house with one wall and construction going on. So he says, I'll rent you a new space. Am I lay lo tarachna. I don't want to bother with moving. Am I rav chama. And here comes his psaf, which you can already know what he's going to say. Bidin kama akev. The person in the house is allowed to say, no, I'm not moving, and get rid of your wall. Isn't this the same as the previous case? So why did Rav Chama have to, first of all, it's a little strange they ask this because these were two different cases that actually happened, but I guess they're wondering why the Gemara bring us both cases. What do we learn from the fact that there's two cases here? Hatu Lamali, what do you need them both for? Ha kamash it's to teach you it's to teach you, even though it doesn't sound clear from this case, but I guess they're saying there's two cases to teach you that even if you didn't even live in the house, even if you used it just for storage, that's still enough to have to move all your stuff and all that. You can insist on, on not moving. Okay, that's the story. Story number three. Two brothers split up an inheritance. One got this beautiful hall. Bechad, like a, like a, or like a nice room, sort of hallway room. Chad mati tarbitza. And the other one got a garden. Now a hall, or this traklin, this, um, maybe hall isn't the right word. Maybe somebody can help me with the translation. I don't know if I care what the translation is. But he got basically this nice room. Okay. Um, one second. One second. Um... Right, they do call it a hall, but it seems to mean, let me just see here, <sighs> small cave, yeah, store booth, okay. It's some sort of nice, nice room, okay? We'll see that as we go on. Um, like maybe when they mean a hall, they mean like a wedding hall, kind of, you know, like a, like a hall, not a hallway, but a hall, it's like a nice room. So he gets this really nice room and the other one gets kind of an empty garden. Okay, so you can see it was a little bit of an unfair division. We'll get back to that issue later. The one who got the garden, and he built a wall, just like the previous story, but he builds a wall that blocks the light from coming into this nice hall. So the person who got the hall, the truckleen says, you're making my room all dark. I'm building in my space. Well, I, if it causes shade to your room, tough love. This is my garden. I can do what I want. I'm a Rav Chama. Already right away we get to. Okay? He can do that. The brother who got the, the garden can put up a wall. So the Gemara is going to ask some questions here. Why is this different from the following case? Similar case, two brothers divided up an inheritance. One got a vineyard, and the other got a wheat field. They must have agreed to this from the beginning. That's when they divided it, it was clear that even though 
One got a vineyard and one got a, a wheat field. The person who got the vineyard, which bordered on the wheat field, gets four cubits into the wheat field because I guess the vines were going to the end. And there's always, you need a space of four cubits to be able to do stuff in your vineyard, like to be able to walk and plow and do and pick. You need a space. So the brother who got the vineyard gets to get four cubits in the field of the brother who got the wheat field. So what do you see here? That the one who got the wheat field is like the one who got the garden and has to basically give some of their property to the other brother. So why is that different here? Why don't we say, okay, even though this is my garden, this is my space, but just like the one who had the, the wheat field had to give up some space, maybe also shouldn't be allowed to build the wall to block the light of the other. So why is this different? Amar le, so Ravina asked Ravashi this, or Ravashi answered, Hatam de alu lahadade. Well, it must be in that case. If you, okay, now think about what's more profitable? A vineyard, because wine is always more profitable than the bread. So the vineyard is more is worth more. So the brother who got the vineyard must have had to pay the brother who had the wheat field to compensate, but you're getting less inheritance. So I'll pay you, I'll compensate you financially. Since he compensated financially, it must have been part of the deal. Well, I'm also paying you so that I get four cubits of your space. To which the Gemara says, good line, Abalhachamat, Tilo Alula Dande. There's no way that if you got this nice hall and I got a, an empty garden, right? Of course, you would have to compensate me as well. It's no different than the vineyard to the, to the wheat field, right? The wheat field is just like the garden. And if they got paid and that's why they gave more, then obviously the one who was living in the garden must have gotten paid by the person who got the nice hall, he must have had to compensate, and therefore he got paid, and therefore he shouldn't build the wall. You can insist, well, you got paid. So that includes, right, not building a wall. And Bechiva Shuftin asking him, what are we talking about? Idiots? In other words, what brother would take the, the garden instead of the hall and not demand money from the other brother? Okay, there's no way, there's no way that that would have happened, right? Alu lahadade, just to help you with the words, means one must have paid the other. Amarle. Even if you assume the person who got the hall had to pay the person who got the, the garden, well, what did he pay him for, though? He paid him for the fact that the person who has the hall has bricks, has, has walls, has beams, right? Has all these, it's, there's, there's um, items that he got as opposed to just getting an empty garden that are worth something. But but he didn't pay him for the airspace, for the basically don't block my sunlight coming in, right? He didn't buy rights to the sunlight that's coming through that it can't be blocked. So that's why this is not the same as that case. That was question number one. Question number two, why can't the person living in the hall say to the brother who's living in the garden, Originally, right, I was supposed to get a nice hall. Now I just got a dark room. Right? This isn't a hall. This is a dark room now. It's ugly, right? You you bought it thinking that was all, I'm sorry, you divided the property thinking, oh, I'm getting this beautiful, sunny, open, light room. And now I have a disgusting, dark room. So I'm so why can't that be a claim? And then basically insist that the brother take down the wall. I'm of Shimi Barashi, Shema Ba'alma Paligle. Now, when they divided it, one got a hall and one got a garden. It's still a hall. You could call it a dark hall, but it's still a hall. Milo, Tanya, and did we not see this in the bright at the end of Baba Metziah? Haomer, bait kor afar any mocher lechav. Somebody says, I'm selling you a bait kor, which normally is an amount of space, right? It's how much you can uh, feel that you can grow a core of produce in. I'm selling you. And then he gives him a field that's only a letta, half that size. Even if it's only worth half, even if it's only the size of, you know, when like we made an arrangement and then you give it to me and I say, wait, this is half the size we set. Kigio, it's still a good sale. Why is that? Shalom asarlo elashma. Because bait core is just another name for saying a field, you know, of a certain size, but it doesn't really mean of a certain size. It's just a field. So what's the difference if the field is a bait core or it's a letech? It's still called a field. 
And by the way, it's only if who do it carry bait core. It's only if they use the the word bait core to mean different size fields. In other words, well, right? It's like saying, I'll give you some Kleenex. And they're not actually Kleenex, they're just tissues. But people call tissues Kleenex. So, you know, you might say, at least that was in the olden days. I don't know if anyone does that anymore. But but you know, something like that where it's a term that means something, but also means something else really, or a, a Tupperware, right? It's not necessarily a Tupperware, it's a different brand, right? Tupperware is a certain brand, but everyone calls it Tupperware. So it's the same kind of idea. Um same thing about a perdes. Now, a perdes in those days meant a field of an orchard of uh, pomegranates. Say you're selling a pomegranate field, uh, right? An orchard of pomegranates, and in the end, doesn't have any pomegranates in it. Still, it's a good sale. because it's just called an orchard. Orchard, you know, as long as Hudimit Kari Pardes, as long as you call other orchards where there's trees orchard, even though really orchard means an orchard of pomegranates, but it came to be known as other things as well. I'm selling you a vineyard, even though it doesn't have any vines in it. That's a little bit of a stranger one. Um, as long as, right, people again use vineyard to be some sort of field, not necessarily what is vines growing. Okay, so. Again, why is it different from that? Why don't you say, right? Uh, sorry, that was the answer. It's a truck clean. Either way you look at it, right? It's a truck clean. But the Gemara says that's not really true, though. Me damn When it's a sale, you can say, well, that's what I sold you. And, you know, this is what it's called by. I sold you a name. I sold you, I, I said this name. This name could mean other things. That's included in the name. But ha chamatse amale adata dahi palge. But one brother could say, and this you could totally imagine, you're dividing up the inheritance of your parents and you say, you know, I really want this room because I love this room, right? This was my favorite room. And I wanted to live in it like my parents lived in it. I wanted to be the exact same thing with the light coming in. And then, right, so that's what they're saying. It's not really similar, which were, puts us back into the question, why can't that brother insist you have to knock down your wall because you now ruined my room. So Amrule, so now they try to explain. Amrule, turning out Amabet, Mar Yunuko, Mar Kashisha, Bere de Ravchista, the Ravashi. So they said to Ravashi, Nahardea la Ta'amai. Nahardea, which is Rav Chama was from Nahardea, and Shmuel, in a minute we're going to quote, are le Ta'amai. They're consistent with their opinions. Da Amar of Nachman Amar Shmuel. Here we quote Shmuel from Nahardea also. Brothers that divide territory, even though it was all one thing, they have nothing on the other. If the water channel goes through that part of the field, the brother with that part of the field gets the water channel. And the other brother can't get anything. If he needs a path to get from that property to that property and it goes through the brother, what one brother got, no, no way, no how. You want it, you got to buy it. In other words, when you divide, you divide it and you get your thing and the other one gets their thing and you can do whatever you want in your part and that fits with their approach. And that's why the person with the hall can't start complaining about the light. That's the approach that we've seen so far. Rav Chama and now Shmuel seem to have that approach. The Rav Amar, right, in general, all three of Rav Chama's psikot are like a laissez-faire approach, right? Leave me alone. Everyone has free reign to do what they want. Again, it seems a little bit in 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 you know, against what we've talked about, Asita Yashar Vatov, that that's not a factor in the legal system, right? And maybe they think you could do that anyway, but legally you can't obligate someone. Okay. It's it's saying maybe one should do that, but you cannot obligate someone and everyone can do what they want. But they end with Rava Amal Yeshlehend. Rava disagrees and says, brothers, no, when you divide it, you have to divide it amicably. And if you need to get through my property to get to yours. Well, I have to let you. And all those, you know, windows, ladders, all this stuff, you have to, right? You basically can't, um, hello note, by the way, what they mean is that you can't say, oh, don't put a wall and block my window. Okay, Sulamot Rashi explains, if you took a bayad and a chatzer and the other one took the aliyah, right? So now let's say one brother's upstairs. Well, where is his ladder going to stand if not the property of the one below? Right, so he has to basically purchase that space, according to them, from the other brother. The other one says, "What do you mean? You divided it, and you knew he was going to need the space for your ladder. Of course, you have to leave the ladder there." So we have these different approaches about this. Fourth case of Rav Chama. So now we're into a different case, different type of case entirely. 
We have these orphans who inherited a loan of their fathers, meaning that they were the creditors. They wanted to collect the loan their father had, so they have the document that says the person owes, owes money. They go to collect the money, and the person pulls out a tavra. What's a tavra? Shin and taf switch. Shoval. Okay, shavra, shoval. What's a shovar? A receipt. Pulls out a receipt. I paid the loan on X date. I'm Rav Chama. Well, I can't let you collect this loan because the guy has a shovar. Okay, let's read it inside, actually. I can't let you collect it because there's a shovar that says the person paid. But I can't tear it up either. In other words, the idea would be, okay, well, if it's paid, then tear up the loan document. So if the person loses their shovar, you know, you won't go and collect the loan again. That's normally what you do when it's clear someone paid. Well, I'm not going to tear it up. Why? When the orphans grow up, they were obviously minors. I mean, obviously, because they don't necessarily have to be. But in this case, they were obviously minors because he said when they grow up, maybe they can bring a proof that this was a forged document because a shovar has signatures, but maybe they could prove the signatures were forged and therefore be able to get their loan back. So I'm not going to tear up the document just yet because I want to give them an opportunity down the road to be able to maybe prove that this guy was lying. I'm going to wrap up a bridge of the Ravina. So Rav Acha, the son of Rava, says to Ravina, is this the halacha? And, and in general, all these four cases, and this is probably why they brought the fourth case, because it really has nothing to do with anything, but since there was this discussion about how Rav Chama Paskin in all these cases, do we hold like him or not? So that's probably why they brought the fourth case. In all the cases, the halacha is like Rav Chama, libar mitavra, other than the shovar. Why? Decide b'shakre lo machazkinan. Rav Chana's stock is based on the fact, and maybe this is actually a bit of a connection, that, that we're concerned that someone's lying, right? Maybe what Rav Chana's saying is there's bad people out there, right? Like, and, and they can you know, get away with it almost, right? The people who don't want to be nice to the other one can get away with it, and this guy can get away with it. But Rav Chana says, right, or maybe Rav Chana feels like there's people you know, who are inherently not going to do the, the right thing. And he, I don't know, I don't know if they're really connected anyway. It requires more thought. But Rav Chama basically says here, we're worried that the guy's lying. And they say, we don't hold like that because why should we assume if the guy pulls out a shovar or a receipt with witnesses, why should we assume that the guy's lying? There's no reason to think that. And therefore we would rip up the star. We don't hold like Rav Chama in that case. Marzutra, but we have a different opinion. Of Marzutra, Bahan Nami Hilchataki Rav Chama. We pass it like Rav Chama in this case as well. Why? And now we're going to learn a little more about the case, it seems. He should have brought out, if he really had a shavar, he should have brought it out when the father was alive. And the fact that he didn't pull it out, it must be he forged it. Now, what you have to assume happened here, the commentaries discuss, is that there must have been witnesses to the fact that the father at some point after the date of the Shavar, let's say the Shavar was August 1st and we were standing on July 1st, the father on July 1st, I'm sorry, the Shavar was July 1st and the father on August 1st says, pay me. And the guy says, I'm not going to pay you. Like, I don't know, I don't have the money, avoids paying for whatever reason and doesn't say, I already paid you back and pull out the Shavar. So if it was dated July 1st and we know that on August 1st, the father demanded money, and the person didn't pull out the shoval, then when the, when the orphans come later in September, October, November, whenever, and the person pulls out a shovar, we have to be concerned that it was a forgery, right? They weren't maybe willing to give it to the father because the father knew that they hadn't paid it back. But, you know, and he would know to say it was a forgery, but when it's orphans, we always know people take advantage and therefore we're concerned that he's lying. So the first opinion, right? The first person we saw didn't think that he was lying and thought we shouldn't hold like Rav Hama. But Mazutra thinks, no, there is concern in this case, particularly, maybe not everyone's considered a shakan, a liar, but in this case, we think there's reason to believe the person's lying, and therefore, we're going to hold like Rav Chama. So according to Mazutra, we hold like Rav Chama in all four cases. Okay, Mishnah. Kofin otolib no bechar v'delet l'chatzer. Now we're going to talk about when people live together, okay, remember, houses opened up into shared courtyards, 
shared courtyard, right? A shared courtyard opened up perhaps into an alleyway, which led to a bunch of different courtyards. The alleyway opened into the public domain, or perhaps the courtyard opens directly into the public domain. There's two types of courtyards, could be that or that. So now the question is, if we live in a shared courtyard, what expenses can one member force the other to share in the expenses of? So according to Tanakama, if I want to build a, a guard booth, because I think we need a guard in the courtyard, and a dele, a door, I can insist that you pay. Not every courtyard needs it. I can't insist you build you pay expenses for this. If I'm crazy and think we need a guard and you don't think we need a guard, then we're going to have to see when do they, when don't they, okay? And how do we determine that? It's a little bit tricky. Now we get to a topic which is going to lead us to a fascinating topic is to how do we collect taxes? Who pays more taxes? Who's exempt from taxes? We're going to end with some things that might actually get you a little bit riled up, so beware. Um... But here it talks simply about we can force inhabitants of the city to share in costs of protective, right? A wall, a, the door, at that time is a double door, okay? It was the kind of doors they had in, in gates to cities. And a bariach and a lock, a bolt, okay? Everyone has to share in the expenses. Not every city needs, uh, needs a wall, okay? Not every city needs protection. Here's another question. If you move into a city, what, do you immediately have to pay the big cost, the heavy cost for all these things of protection for the city? You'd bet chodesh. Only if you're there for 12 months already, then you have to start paying. Um, I was thinking it's like a shul and a building fund. You know, do you have to pay immediately? You, the first year you become members, you have to pay the building fund. You know, who knows if you're going to stay there or not. But if you bought already property there, then you already become um, like a member of the city immediately and you have to already pay for the city, for the cost for the city. So now the Gemara is going to start off with a bunch of questions. The main word, debate Shar Ma'al Yutahi. Okay, well, one major question. Is it a good thing to build a Beit Shar? Right, it seems very clear. I want to build a guard booth. That's a good thing for our courtyard. It protects us, right? It seems very clear it's good. So why is Gemara asking? Well, ha'hahu chasida. There was a chasid. To have a ragil Eliyahu dava mishtayi ba'adeh. Eliyahu used to talk to him all the time. He put up this Beit Shar guard booth by his courtyard. And Eliyahu stopped talking to him. Why did Eliyahu stop talking to him? So Rashi explains. Once you put up the guard booth, it prevents the sound of the poor people outside your courtyard who are screaming, I need help, I need help, I need help. No one's going to hear them anymore. And then you didn't give charity anymore after you put up this guard booth. And we're going to get to, this is like very famous in the very first chapter of Baba Batra. We're going to get there very shortly. It's long sugyot about staka, charity, and the importance of charity. So Eliyahu stopped visiting this person because he prevented himself. He basically limited his ability to give charity and to help people who came asking for money. So how do we resolve this? Our mission seems to say it's fine. And this story seems to say it's not fine at all. These are my favorite things when you could say this one is inside, this one is outside, which one is which. It depends who you are, what your commentary says. So some Rashi thinks that um, Rashi says it's um, the inner courtyard is worse because then the door of the Chatser is Na'ul and the, the Beit Shar basically prevents the sound from getting in. If the Beit Shar is outside, well, then he can get up to the door, which is kind of the Beit Shara seems to be before the door. Somehow then he can get in. It's hard to understand, really. That's why I prefer the Rimi Gash, who actually says it's the opposite. It's specifically if it's outside that it prevents the poor from being heard in the city. And when it's inside, they can already get up to the gate. So, you know, so the inside of the of the courtyard and then people will hear them. So it's a difference of opinion. Which one? We're going to have four possible answers. That was option one. e by a second option. Hava hami barai. Both are talking outside. If there was a door also, well, then it really prevents. Even that, right? If, if the guard booth is outside and there's a door, then they, if there's if there's no door, then it's open. So then they'll hear the poor people when they're inside. You could say there was a door. It had a way to open it. Right? And it didn't have, right? It had a, it had a one was, bolted and one wasn't bolted 
It could have been both were bolted. But lo kasha had the potacha didemi kavai had the potacha didemi barai. Right? Imagine those old locks you have with the bolt and the bathroom doors they used to have before they had you know the easier ones where you would bolt it in. So you could have a bolt like that, which kind of prevents animals and things like that from getting in. But you can open it from the outside, right? The the part is like like as if you're in the bathroom, right? You can open the bolt yourself. So if it opens from the outside, then the poor people can open it and get in. If it opens from the inside, then they can't. Okay, so that was all how to resolve that. Now we're going to move on to the next section. If you remember, Rashbag disagreed and said not every place needs. And now we're going to see for both these cases where Rashbag disagrees, we're going to see a bright that elaborates on Rashbag and what Rashbag holds. Like, how do you define when it needs, when it doesn't need? It all depends. Does your courier open up into the public domain or not? If it opens it to the public domain directly, and there's no mavoy alleyway, then it needs protection. If it opens up into a shared mavoy alleyway, well, that there's not a lot of people there. You don't need protection. Virabana, what do they say? And here's kind of a, a difference in outlook, and we all know there's different people who hold different ways about this. You have to be worried about all circumstances. You know, it could be even though it's an alleyway, but since the alleyway opens up into the public domain, if the public domain gets busy, people will go into the alley. And therefore, your courtyard needs protection, right? This is you know, the worrier type of approach. You know, what if? So you can insist on having this char and making sure the you, know, you can insist on the other person paying because... Perhaps you'll get into a dangerous situation. And that's the rabbi's approach. And Rashbag says, come on, there's no real, there's no clear and present danger. Kofino told no like ear. I'm going to skip the next few words because most people take it out. Tanu Rabbana, we'll just say Tanu Rabbana. And then Raman Shim and Gamli Elomin. Lo kolayarot ru yal lechoma, like iras mukhalisfa, ru yal lechoma, shenas mukhalisfa, na ru yal lechoma. If you're on the border with enemy territory, then you need it. If you're not, Okay, your your next town over is a very friendly area, and the next town over also. You know, if you're not near the border, then you don't have to worry about. Virabanan again, zimin Sometimes you know enemies come from afar and they get into your town anyway. Okay, right. Fortunately, this is a very real situation that we're dealing with right now in Israel um, about the border. Tov. Here comes the real big question about who pays taxes and how do we divide taxes. So Rabbi Elazar asked Rabbi Yochanan this question. Kishahen govim, when they take the taxes, now we're talking about taxes for protection of the city. Right nowadays, taxes go to all sorts of things, but assuming that we're talking about taxes that go specifically toward defense of the country, okay? Who has to spend more money? Lefina fashot govim. Do we go by how many people live in your house? Because theoretically, the enemy is coming to kill people. So the more people you have, the more protection you need from them killing you. Or is the enemy generally coming for money? And therefore, the richer people need to pay more. Right now, normally, right, there's always this debate, you know, do rich people need to pay higher taxes or not? You know, generally they do pay higher taxes, but, you know, there it's more, well, maybe they have more, so they should give more. Here it's not because of that. It's because they need the protection the most because they're the people whose money is going to get, going to get taken. He says it goes by money. How much money you have, that's how much you have to pay more, not by nefashot. And Elazar, my son, he wasn't his son, he was his student, but Elazar, my son, in a term of endearment, make sure to make this kavaba masmerot, put in um, um, nails, okay? We said this before, by the way. I, I hope I read this line. Somehow I think I skipped it. But after we had the thing about Rav Nachman and Sh quoting Shmuel, who said, you know, that everyone is free to do what they want, he also said, he's a rubahen shalachot buotein. These are serious, you know, set halachot. Same idea here. This is very set. It's a very set thing. This is how it goes. Okay, this is a bit of a commentary about, is it that they come, you know, to kill or for money? Or some people say that even though they come mostly for money, they might also come to kill, and therefore, do we also do it by that? In other words, do we factor both issues? Uh, do both issues come into play? Then we have a different gear. Ikad Amri. Some people say that the question of Rabbi was didn't was wasn't it by by person or by, you know by head or by money, but by wealth. 
Bamine Rabbi Lazar Rabbi Yachan, Shem Govim, Lepi Kiruv Batim Hem Govim, the people closer to the wall have to pay more because they're the most in danger. Oh, Dilma Lepi Mamam Govim. No one even thinks it's fine to hush up. It's obvious that they're coming for money, but they're going to get to the people first who are closer to the wall. Or is it according to money? So we have two different opinions here. What he asked and what he said, you have to establish forever. I, I went to look in the Shulchan Aruch to see how they passed in, and I want to just tell you, you should read it. It's very interesting. In Choshe Mishpat Kuf Samach Gimel, uh, 163, Halacha Seif Gimel. I, I wanted to bring something from there. It is so long, the, the discussion about this and the different opinions, especially the Ramah, it's the commentary, the Ashkenazi commentary in the Shulchan Aruch, brings in a huge long list of all sorts of Rishonim that had comments on this and nuances. And you can see why this was a very nuanced, important issue because it's like taxes are one of the biggest issues for everybody nowadays, right? People are always talking about taxes and people vote based on taxes and all that. This is also, right, it's a very big, um, it's a very big issue. And it's interesting because it's also taxes and defense, which also is one of the other major issues. Okay, Rabbi Yehuda Nesia, here comes the 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 more challenging part of our daf to, to swallow. I know it's getting late. We're almost done. I did say the Tafim of Baba Batra are shorter. They're, they're going to be when we get to really the third chapter. That's when the Rosh Bam commentary replaces Rashi. In any case, Rabbi Yudin Nesir Rama Deshura Adra Bana. So he said the rabbis, the Torah scholars also have to pay taxes. Remember that he says this because we're going to get sidetracked because I'm a rich Lakish. What do you mean? The rabbis don't need protection. Okay, what does this mean? I will count them. They'll be more. They'll be more than the sand. Who is this talking to? If we're going to say that tzaddikim are more than the sand and the and the earth, it can't possibly be. How could they be nefisha michala? They can't be more than the sand. All the Jews are considered like sand. Tzaddikim atzman mechol yerbiyun. They can't be the the smaller amount. Who are the righteous people? Can't be more than sand. So, uh, you know, number more than sand. El hachikamar. Esperem lema sehem shal tzadkim. I will count their actions. Their actions are mechol yorbun. And kal v'chomer. Ma chol shemu'at megen alayam. The chol, it's not even so great, meaning it's less than the ma'asim of tzadkim. And yet it protects from the water, from getting into the shore, you know, from getting into the houses and stuff and destroying them. It's an interesting way of thinking about the sand, that it protects from... Destruction, their masim that are greater than sand protect them. So they don't need to pay taxes. Now, Rabbi Yochanan didn't disagree with him. He just said, why don't you learn it from this other pasu? Which is, it's from Shira Shim. Right? I am like a wall, meaning that's the Torah that protects, like a, like a wall that protects, and my breasts are like are um, migdalot, big towers that protect. That's the time of because they nurse the people with their with their teaching. So they protect. So they don't need to pay for protection for defense of the city. Obviously, this is a big issue nowadays. Obviously, connects somewhat with Giyus Haredim and uh, having you know Haredim serve in the army, and they say we're protecting the city with our learning, with the, the you know the country with our learning. And you know, first of all, this is Tamid Chachamim. Not everybody who's Haredi is a Tamid Chacham. Um, and it's a big question how we, you know, how we do this. It happens. I also looked up the halacha here. We possibly reached the key. Rabbi Yudin Nesia didn't agree and said, of course, they have to share in the cost. Here, it seems like they don't have to pay taxes, which raises a lot of difficult questions. I said it might get you up in arms because uh, it's difficult sugya to, to just read and say, oh, yeah, they, you know, the Torah protects and we don't need, they don't need to share in the cost. Or perhaps, you know, if you take it farther in the protection of the country. Okay. With this, we're going to end our daf bit of a heated spot. Um, quick review, Rapama had these three psakim, which is, you know, do what you want in your territory. You don't have to help the other necessarily. Um, we can't force you to anyway, even though maybe you should, even though he didn't say that, but you could say at least that. And then the case of the atomium. And then with that, we got to what do you have to share in costs of? And we had a few issues that came up when we on about the Beit Shar and that prevents poor people. How do we deal with that, right? We made some four distinctions between that source and that. And then we had, Rashbag, when he disagrees, so where are his borders? What, what does he think? When do you decide it needs protection, doesn't need protection? And then we have this question of how we how we take the taxes upon, you know, who has to pay more taxes than everyone else and who perhaps is exempt from taxes. And again, Rabbi Yudin said they're not, 
Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan seem to say they are. With that, we finish for today's daf. Wishing everyone a good day.